Welcome to the Wildland Plant Identification class here at the University of Idaho. I'm Karen Launchball. I'm one of the instructors of this class, and I'm really happy to hear that you're interested in plant identification. Most of the plants we'll study in this class are shrubs, forbs, and grasses, things that are common on rangelands. And it's really important to know and, I, and recognize them out there because you, you can't conserve or manage rangelands without knowing the, the elements of the land, sort of the ABCs. They'll tell you the condition of the land and your opportunities for management. But before we can even get started in uh, identifying plants and learning the difference between individual species, we have to learn some terminology. So this um, presentation is on the types and categories of rangeland plants. First, uh, there are four growth forms. These are probably familiar terms for you, but we're going to go through them and make sure you understand what grasses, grass-like plants, forbs, and shrubs and trees are. Okay, just four examples. Grasses, of course, there are those uh, long stemmy plants that you probably know of. Grass-like plants are pretty well named. They look like grasses. Forbs, uh, here's an example of tailcup lupin and, and uh, woody plants such as big sagebrush. So let's start with grasses. You probably have an idea in your head of what a grass is. And they're, the, of course, the main characteristic or the main plant on grasslands. And grasslands are really important. They cover about a fifth of the Earth's land surface. And uh, grasses themselves are, are important in many other shrublands and uh, savannas and other ecosystems. So when you think about what a grass is, think about a, a straw, like from a straw bale. And if you run your finger up and down that straw, you'll recognize that those uh, stems are jointed. And so those joints are called nodes. And if you look at the leaves, especially if you look at them from above, you'll see that there are two, there's two rows of leaves. In other words, there's one on one side and then one on the other, and they kind of alternate up the stem, uh, one on the e one side and then on the other. The veins, if you laid the leaf flat, you'd see that the veins are parallel to the margin of the leaf. So uh, that's one of the characteristics of grasses is those parallel veins. Grasses do not have showy flowers. Some have kind of colorful anthers, but grasses don't have showy flowers because they're wind pollinated. So they don't, uh, you know, the pollen from one plant gets to another just by the wind. They don't have to attract pollinators like insects, etc. So they usually don't have showy flowers. Um, all grasses are herbaceous. They're not woody. They die back to the ground every year. Some exceptions, some plants get a little bit lignified like bamboo. Bamboo is actually a grass and you can build furniture with bamboo. So it has, it's pretty strong. Um, but still most all grasses are, would be uh, herbaceous. Um, they vary from size from little teeny tiny plants like six weeks fescue. They can be just two, three inches tall uh, to bamboo as I mentioned. There's great morphological variation. The family that all grasses are in is the Poaceae family. There's over, over 500 genera and 8,000 species. And some of those species include plants that are really important to humans, such as wheat and rye and corn and barley. So grasses are really important to humans and livestock and wildlife. Grass-like plants, as, you, uh, as the name suggests, they, they look like grasses, but they're a little bit different. Grasses have hollow stems. Uh, Grass-like plants have solid stems, and they don't have any joints on the stems either. Um, many, sh uh, not many, but not all grass-like plants have triangular stems. Sedges, especially, have triangular stems. The veins are parallel, like grasses. They're, the veins are parallel to the margin. And this group of grass-like plants would be um, sedges and rushes would be two of the most common groups of plants that are grass-like. Forbs, that might not be a common term for you, but I'm sure you know what forbs are. Um, they're often what, you know, the wildflowers on rangeland or weeds, many of the weeds are forbs. So they're herbaceous plants. That means the stems die back to the ground every year. Uh, they have broad leaves, you know, kind of hand-sized leaves often and showy flowers. So they are pollinated by insects and other pollinators. So they have to have showy flowers to attract uh, those insects. Most of them anyways have showy flowers. The veins can vary immensely. Many of them are net-like patterns. Some can be parallel. They can vary quite a lot. They can be in the shape of a hand, but just basically they're, they're throughout the leaf surface. Again, I mentioned that there are a lot of the wildflowers and weeds that we um, think of are forbs. An interesting thing about forbs is uh, they defend themselves from herbivory, uh, often through toxins. So many of the poisonous plants that we 
deal with or that we manage on rangelands are poisonous plants. Shrubs and, and trees, again, I'm sure it's familiar to you. Just first of all, remember a tree is a plant that has a single main stem and a shrub is, usually has multiple main stems. That, that is a growth form in that some plants can be in the form of trees or shrubs. They're all woody plants though, uh, and they have broad leaves, uh, or they could be needles or scales, so they could vary immensely. Uh, they're all perennial plants. They all gr live several years. So shrubs and trees will cover quite a lot in this plant, in this class. Um, some interesting characteristics of shrubs and trees is that they are often found in deserts or really xeric systems because they can they have roots that can go way down into the soil surface and, and um, bring up water from very deep um, deep in the soil horizon. So they can invade into grasses in grassland systems because they can uh, access some of that deeper water. Um, they do they're not um, often uh, grazed out. In other words, plants aren't, animals aren't usually attracted to them because they have ways to defend against grazing. They may have chemicals, certainly they might have thorns or uh, really hard stems that are difficult to eat, so they're physically defended. And they may be really large plants so that even if an animal eats them, they can survive that grazing. Here's just a diagram that you'll often see in your textbook and in other places. Some, again, describing some of those differences between those growth forms. Grasses have hollow stems. They have jointed stems. They have leaves on two sides of the, I'm sorry, they have leaves on two sides of the stem. Grass-like plants have solid stems, oftentimes triangular, other times round. The veins are usually parallel and their leaves can be either on two sides of the stem or they can be on three sides if they're triangular stems. Forbs and shrubs both have solid stems. Uh, they both have veins that are net-like. And the difference is because forbs are herbaceous, they don't have those annual growth rings. Whereas shrubs, as they, they each year they, they put on another, uh, um, another set of growth on their stems, and that's how they become woody. So they have those growth rings. So little different stems. Lifespan. Something we'll talk a lot about um, the length of time that a plant lives from when it starts from seed, beginning development, to the death of it, the plant. Annuals are plants that live one growing season. Uh, we're going to talk about winter annuals and summer annuals. Biannuals live two growing seasons, and perennials live year, year on, year on, year on. And depending on the plant, it can be decades uh, that they can survive. Let's start with annuals and winter annuals. Uh, we have a lot of winter annuals in Idaho. Um, these are plants like, like cheatgrass is an example. They actually start in the winter. They're, I'm sorry, they start in the fall by germination. So in the fall, the seed goes down and starts to germinate. Over the winter, they're just dormant. They're just, just really low. And uh, early in the spring, you start to see green. So they, they are, they're ready to start growth very early in the spring. Early in the summer, midsummer or so, they die. They've, they've completed their whole life cycle, and that's a, a great way for them to avoid the really worst part of the growing season late in the season when it's hot and dry. The seeds lay on the surface most of the summer, and then in the fall, they germinate, and on and on and on. So the plant survives from year to year by seeds, and it germinates in the fall. Summer annuals are similar. A lot of the mustards are summer annuals, for example. So their seeds actually germinate in the spring, they grow most of the summer and they produce their fall their seeds either late summer or fall and then those seeds lie on the soil surface all winter so the plant dies and those seeds are, are not germinating all winter and then they start in the spring so they tend to come and, and start growth a little bit later than the winter annuals and they tend to die um, later than the winter annuals Biennials are interesting plants. They, they germinate one spring. The first year they just produ produce a rosette of leaves and they, they really spend uh, energy to develop roots. Those roots survive the first winter and then in this, the following spring, the second spring, they produce a flower stalk, they produce seeds, and then they die. Um, mullen is a common, common example of, uh, of a biennial. If you know them, it, it, it survives its first year just as a rosette and then it forms a uh, a seed stock the next year. Most plants on rangelands are perennials. Most of the ones we'll study in this class are perennials. They they germinate. Uh, they they grow the first year. They may produce flowers the first year, or they may stay in a vegetative stage for a year or two, 
And then they get into the cycle where every year, every winter they go dormant, every spring they come out of that dormancy, they grow for a while and they produce seeds. And then they go dormant, come out of dormancy, grow for a while, produce seeds. And they do that on and on and on until they die. And um, uh, kind of a misconception early on in range management was that plants, perennial plants may live only a few years. And now we know largely from photography, uh, photograph, photography of, of individual plots that grasses, for example, can, can live decades. Um, we're just actually starting to kind of track how long some of these plants might live. Another characteristic of wildland plants that's important, especially if we're managing forage or fire, is when is the plant dormant and when does it have its most active growth? That, um, th those are described in sort of two categories, cool season plants, warm season plants. Cool season plants, often called C3 plants, they're called C3 plants because the type of photosynthesis they have yields a carbon that is a three carbon sugar that is the first stable output of photosynthesis. So they're called C3 plants because of that three carbon sugar. Uh, they grow earlier in the year than warm season plants. They start early in the spring. They also can have a little bit of green up in the fall. So in this graph, you'll see kind of that green line where they might start growth. In Idaho, we'll start growth in March and April. Peak growth would be June. July maybe, that would be a little bit late. Uh, and then they are they kind of just get dry and dormant throughout the summer and they might green up a little bit in the fall. So uh, they're um, important plants to provide forage for wildlife and livestock early in the spring, late in the fall, and at um, higher elevations, they're very important. They're adapted to cool, wet conditions and that's again because of that C3 photosynthetic pathway. And at least for Idaho, because we're in Idaho, and because Idaho is a cool place, uh, most all of the plants in Idaho, well over 90% of, of the native flora of Idaho are cool season plants. Warm season plants have a little different uh, cycle. They don't start greening up until quite late in the spring, May, June. And so most of their growth is in the warm periods of the season. They are called C4 plants because their photosynthetic pathway has a um, characteristics that allow them to photosynthesize in warmer, drier conditions. So they have uh, the, the first stable carbon, I'm sorry, the first stable sugar in that photosynthetic pathway is a four carbon sugar. So that's why they're called C4 plants. So warm season plants, C4 plants, that allows them to grow in warmer, drier periods. So that's when we see their maximum growth um, in June, July peak right out in the, at the middle of the summer. They provide very important forage for animals in the summer months. Again, they're adapted to those higher, drier, higher and um, drier conditions. Uh, they uh, grow in the warm regions of Idaho. Uh, but we don't have very many warm season plants. There's a few that you'll find down in the Snake River Plains or at the lower elevations. Uh, for any of you that live or have lived in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, nearly all their plants are warm season and they have very few cool season plants because that photosynthetic pathway is adapted to those drier, hotter conditions. So depending on where you are, uh, what the general kind of yearly growth uh, of plants are, uh, you'll have either cool or warm. If you're right down in the middle of, say, the, in the middle of the plains in Kansas, Oklahoma, they have about a, a good mix of cool and warm season plants because they have, they have good growth in the spring and they have also warm seasons in the summer. Uh, another characteristic we need to know about plants is origin or where they came from. Uh, the origin is, is the area where the plant evolved. In, in this class and in most kind of parlance of plants, native plants are ones that originated in North America. However, for some people that are really into and really working on native plant seeds, they, they may want native plants that are only um, have their origin within a particular state or even a particular county. So they want plants that are very local. But in this class, a native plant would be anything that originated in North America. Introduced plants are those that came from outside North America and were brought here either intentionally or accidentally. So think about some reasons that these plants might have come here and we might have brought plants from other regions to North America. H humans might have brought them intentionally because for crops or for medicines or for, for ornamental plants. 
So there's, uh, or for conservation, some plants were brought here to, to try to really improve and conserve rangelands, but they were brought here intentionally with all good intentions. Uh, some of them have gone bad and, and have sort of to tried to take over. Other plants were just accidental. They were in all other things that were being bought here, brought here, such as livestock, hay, grain. They might have even been in the ballast of ships or even shipping crates and containers. So those are, there's many reasons that plants would have occurred, come here, and they'd be introduced plants. Okay, that's just a few of the pl terms that we're going to use in this class, and, and that'll be a way to get, get us started so we can have conversations and start to learn individual plant species.